What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Parties, and today's video is for the sickos. This is like, what, March 31st, I think, is when this video will drop. There's nothing about rookies in the title. There are no big name NFL players in the thumbnail. Like you clicked on this video because you're watching a deep sleeper running back video in March. You're you're a sicko if you're here and this one's for you. I'm gonna be talking about some deep sleepers. No Kenneth Gainwell here. No Eno Benjamin here. No Tony fucking Pollard here. These are guys who we're not hoping for big contracts for them. We're not hoping that they like usurp established running backs on their depth charts. We're hoping that these guys are the dudes at the bottom of depth charts who are like secretly really good. And I think there are some indicators that they are. So let's get into it. <laughs> Number one, I'm going to talk about these guys in order from most likely to be relevant to least likely to, to be relevant, but that also means I'm talking about them from least fun to most fun. So we'll get to the, the most fun at the end. We'll start with the least fun, but the most relevant. And that guy is Dearness Johnson. Dearness Johnson plays for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, if you go back to high school, he was rated as a three-star recruit. His 24-7 sports composite rating was 0.87. Two six, which is decent. For reference, Josh Jacobs was rated at .8725, so Dearness Johnson, back in high school, was considered better than Josh Jacobs. He ended up at USF, where he was neither productive or efficient. And I like to, if you've seen any of my videos, you know this, but I like to judge player efficiency based on the efficiency of the other guys on their team. In the same way that market share stats work, we're comparing the production of a player to the offense in which he operates. I do the same thing with efficiency. Compared to the environment in which he operates, if you're outdoing your teammates, to a certain degree, you're probably good. And Dearness Johnson was neither productive nor efficient relative to his teammates in college. But a lot of that was because he played behind Marlon Mack for three years, who, you know, looking back, was one of the most productive, most efficient, best pure runners we've seen come out of college football in the, in the last half decade, especially among small school guys. So Dearness Johnson played behind Marlon Mack. He was also not athletic. He ran 4.81 in the 40, which is very bad. 15th percentile burst score. 30th percentile agility score, just no real like meal ticket athletic traits, but he was really dynamic as a receiver in college. Obviously in a limited role behind Marlon Mack, he had 72 receptions, he had an 11% target share, which is in the 71st percentile, and he was used pretty dynamically. He was split out wider in the slot 12% of the time. He was targeted on average 5.3 yards downfield, which is ridiculous for a running back. That's in the 96th percentile. And he was very efficient. He averaged 10.1 yards per target. That's in the 87th percentile. And his true catch rate, which just looks at targets that were deemed catchable, he had a 100% true catch rate. So he caught literally every ball thrown his way that was catchable in college. And then he ended up going undrafted in 2018. And a lot of that was, you know, he went to a small school, not super productive. I don't know how much NFL teams care about like efficiency, but he wasn't efficient. He wasn't athletic. He's not a big dude. He's like, I forget, like 200 pounds or something, but he went undrafted. And according to Wikipedia, it said after going undrafted in the 2018 NFL draft, Johnson was invited to the New Orleans Saints rookie minicamp, but was not signed. Johnson then spent the rest of 2018 fishing for Mahi Mahi in Key West with a friend. So our guy spent four years in South Florida going to college, playing football. He then spent rookie minicamp in New Orleans. And then after not making the team, he decided I'm just going to chill in Key West and fish for the rest of the year. Like, my guy was living like an absolute king throughout his teens and early 20s. And then it ended. He ended up playing with the Orlando Apollos, which, you know, Orlando, it's not a, not a bad gig either. And in eight games in the AAF, he had 592 yards from scrimmage. So pretty solid production in the AAF. And then he ended up joining the Browns in 2018. His first season, he had 10 touches for 92 yards, pretty solid per touch efficiency. And then in 2020, 36 touches for 180 yards. And one metric that I've developed that I like to use to judge player efficiency is box adjusted efficiency rating. So yards per carry, kind of like I just alluded to, has a lot of flaws in that like what does six yards per carry mean on the Ravens versus what does six yards per carry mean on the Browns like are those equivalent situations the offensive lines are different the quarterbacks are different the play calling is different all of that is tough to makes efficiency tough to compare across teams so I like to contextualize things with just comparing player efficiency to the other guys in the team, given that those situational factors are controlled for. A situational factor that's not controlled for in team relative yards per carry is the box counts that a player is running into. There's a lot of data that suggests the 
amount of defenders in the box is a large determining factor in the outcome of any given running play. And so I developed this metric, box adjusted efficiency rating, that isolates team relative performance to each box count and then uses a weighted average given the amount of carries a player had in each box count to produce a percentage that represents how much of the rest of the team's per carry output is a player producing on his carries given the box counts he faced. Anything over 100% would mean you're outdoing your teammates. Anything below 100% would mean you're being outperformed by those teammates. Anyway, Dearness Johnson's box adjusted efficiency rating in 2020 was 100.8%, so barely higher than the other guys on the team, but that was on a backfield that had 387 combined carries from Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. So ridiculously talented teammates, and he's outproducing the per carry efficiency of the collective other guys on the team by a very small bit, which is impressive given how talented those guys are. And then in 2021, his role expanded quite a bit. He had 119 touches for 671 yards, 5.36 yards per carry. His box adjusted efficiency rating in 2021, 107% which is a 60th percentile mark, and his relative success rate, which is similar to box adjusted efficiency rating in the way that it contextualizes things for, for box count, but instead of looking at an average, it looks at the rate at which you're succeeding on your carries, given like how often are you gaining a requisite amount of yards given down a distance. So it's a measure of consistency. And his relative success rate was 7%, so he's succeeding on 7% greater of his runs than his teammates, which is an 82nd percentile mark, again, on a team that had 306 combined carries from Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. Pretty impressive. Among 49 running backs in the NFL last year, with over 100 carries, Dearness Johnson was 12th if you look at a composite between like the percentile ranks of his box adjusted efficiency rating and his relative success rate. So overall efficiency times consistency on a per carry basis, mix the two, and it gives you sort of like a, an overall how good is this guy at running the ball composite. And per that metric, Johnson was 12th out of 49 running backs with at least 100 carries, and the guys ahead of him on that list would be Alvin Kamara, Khalil Herbert, Rashad Penny, Chase Edmonds, Dalvin Cook, Daryl Henderson, Austin Eckler, Rex Burkhead, James Robinson, Jonathan Taylor, Najee Harris. Every single one of those guys, outside of maybe Rex Burkhead, is getting buzz in Dynasty. Khalil Herbert's a sexy sleeper. Chase Edmonds just signed a big contract with the Dolphins. I mean, relatively big. And a lot of those other guys are like RB1, RB2 level dudes. As far as I can tell, Dearness Johnson is not getting much buzz, and he probably should be. So basically the case for him is number one, over the last two seasons, he's been an objectively better, objectively more efficient, objectively more consistent consistent runner than Kareem Hunt has been. Number two, most handcuffs across the league. Like if you're Alexander Madison, you're a talented player. Your fantasy value is completely predicated on whether or not Dalvin Cook gets hurt. It seems likely that Dalvin Cook will get hurt at some point in the season. He usually misses a couple games, but if he doesn't, and for the stretches in which he's healthy, Alexander Madison is useless, completely irrelevant for fantasy. Dearness Johnson is in a fairly unique situation where he gains fantasy relevance via an injury to one of both of Kareem Hunt or Nick Chubb. His odds of becoming fantasy relevant are doubled in relation to other handcuffs in the league who are behind a single bell cow running back. So that's a point in his favor. And three, per DLF, he's going in the 17th round as the RB63 right now. And on keep trade cut, he's the RB53. He's very inexpensive in Dynasty. He's an efficient player. He has been throughout his NFL career. He's been better than Kareem Hunt on a per-touch basis, and he needs an injury to Kareem Hunt or Nick Chubb rather than an injury to one of them in order to get fantasy relevance, get work on the ground. He could step into like an RB2 chair with an injury to either of those guys. He's an exciting player. Go get him on your team. The second guy I want to talk about is Dontrell Hilliard. He also went undrafted in 2018, and uh, but unlike Dearness Johnson, I have no idea why Dontrell Hilliard went undrafted. He had a good career at Tulane. The seasonal dominator ratings he posted were in the 65th, 67th, 58th, and 65th percentiles, above average every season, significantly above average in three out of four seasons, and based on his seasonal dominator ratings, based on the level of the program at which he played, the closest production comps in my database to him are Elijah McGuire, Robert Turbin, Ito Smith, Smith, Elijah Mitchell, and Jordan Howard. All of those guys have gotten work in the NFL. Several of them have been like RB1, RB2 level producers in fantasy, and every single one of them was selected by at least the sixth round in the NFL draft. Dontra Hilliard went undrafted, and I'm, I'm not sure what makes him you know, materially different than those guys. He was very athletic. He ran a 4-4-2 in the 40, 66th percentile scores in bursts and agility. And if you look at his like physical profile, 
his athletic profile, his rushing efficiency in college, he's very similar to Darrington Evans, who was a third round pick. They're within a pound of each other. They're within one one hundredth of a second of each other in the 40. Darrington Evans is a little higher in the burst score, but they're both good there. Very similar efficiency numbers in college, both big play guys. And then if you look at their receiving stats, Dontrell Hilliard was both more involved as a receiver and more efficient as a receiver than, than Darrington Evans was. And he was also used very dynamically. He was split out wider in the slot 16% of the time. He was targeted 2.2 yards downfield on average. Those are both in the 83rd percentile. And he probably would have had an even more impressive resume as a receiver if Tulane hadn't switched coaches after his sophomore season. In his first two years on campus, he had 53 receptions. In his final two seasons on campus, after the coaching change, he only had 17 receptions. You know, maybe the biggest strength of his game was taken away from him as he was like, you know, a small school guy looking forward to the NFL, hoping to get some exposure from scouts. A big strength of his, you know, overall game was taken from him. That might be a reason he went undrafted, but I think he's better than those final two years show. He averaged over 25 receptions per season as an underclassman. He's he's a legitimately good player. But he went undrafted in 2018. He latched on with the Browns between 2018 and 2020, but was mostly just like a kicker turner. He didn't really contribute on offense. But then he signed with the Titans in 2021 and was pretty dang good. Um, he only played eight games, but he had 56 carries, 350 yards, 6.3 yards per carry, which is obviously very high. And his box adjusted efficiency rating on a Titans team that had Derrick Henry and Deontay Foreman, who was also playing well, was 153%, which is in the 95th percentile. And his relative success rate was 2.8%, which is a 64th percentile mark. So he was both incredibly efficient and very consistent relative to quality teammates. He's currently unsigned. He's not under contract with the Titans right now. I don't know where he ends up. He's not one of these guys who's like going to explode in value when he signs a contract. He's, it's not like we were waiting for him in the same way we were waiting for like James Conner, Chase Edmonds, Melvin Gordon. He's kind of a random dude as far as like, you know, name recognition goes, but he's currently unsigned. If he ends up with the Titans again, I kind of like that for him. That's a fairly fragile depth chart like Derrick Henry. Um, I made a video about him a couple weeks ago. He is older now, coming off injury, just had the least healthy and least efficient season of his career. I don't remember if Deontay Foreman is under contract, but he's also like a bigger dude, um, not too young anymore, has a, you know, Achilles injury in his history. That's an ascendable depth chart as far as, you know, like how injuries shake out and things like that. If Dontrell Hilliard ends up with the Titans again, I like that. He could be interesting in a lot of places around the league. He's currently going in the 19th round as the RB83 per DLF, and on keep trade cut, he's the RB104. He's completely free in Dynasty. I think he's a good player. The third guy I want to talk about is Raquel Armstead, who I think most people are a little bit more familiar with Raquel Armstead. He had a little bit of buzz um, back when he got drafted in 2019, taken out of Temple in the fifth round. And basically the case for him is he's big, athletic, and he was productive in college. He's 5'11", 220. He ran 4'4", 5 in the 40. That's an 89th percentile uh, 40 time, 94th percentile speed score. And he's got upper percentile agility in the 59th percentile. And his senior year at Temple, he posted a 32% dominator rating, which is in the 73rd percentile for fourth year college players. As a rookie with the Jaguars in 2019, he was absolutely trash. 49 touches, 252 yards, 3.1 yards per carry, just terrible. In 2020, he got COVID in August and again in September. He ended up being hospitalized twice with COVID or with complications from COVID and missed the entire season. And then he was cut from the team in May. So kind of just a lost season for him in 2020 after struggling to acclimate to the league in 2019. And then early last year, he kind of bounced around on a couple practice squads, but then he ended up being signed by the Jaguars again in late December. And just 11 days later, after not having played football for what, like two years at that point, he played in a game, he played that week and the following week. He had 15 carries for 80 yards, so obviously we're dealing with a very small sample here, but 15 carries, 80 yards, it's positive efficiency. He had a 135.6 box-adjusted efficiency rating, which is in the 90th percentile. His relative success rate was 8.7% in the 88th percentile, and some of that like per-carry efficiency was fueled by a 26-yard run against the Browns. When you only have 15 carries for 80 yards, a 26-yard run is a very large chunk of that, obviously. But even if you remove that carry from the sample, he was still more efficient on a per-touch basis without that run than other guys on the team like Daria Gunbowale and Carlos Hyde. And relative success rate is a measure of consistency. It doesn't know that he gained 26 yards on that run. It just knows that he succeeded on that run. And 
it's a binary success failure tag on every run for success rate. And he was succeeding on a much greater percentage of his 15 carries than the other guys in the team were on their carries. So the other thing is that this is not the first time we've seen him be really efficient. Back when he was a senior at Temple, 2018 is as far back as the box count data I have access to goes. So I don't have numbers for his first three years at Temple. But as a senior at Temple, in 2018, he posted a 174% box adjusted efficiency rating, which is the second highest single season Bay rating of any player in my database behind only David Montgomery's junior season at Iowa State. And his relative success rate that season was 7.8% in the 88th percentile. So this last season with the Jags on limited work, we saw a guy who is 220 pounds and runs a 4.45. We saw him post 90th percentile efficiency, near 90th percentile consistency on a small sample after having done basically the same thing in college at Temple. He's super efficient in limited work. He's got a history of production and super efficiency in college. He's big and fast. And he's also on a fairly fragile depth chart. I just made a Travis Etienne video that dropped on Sunday. Etienne is coming off a Liz Frank injury. I'm optimistic about him recovering from that well, but the injury risk is what it is. James Robinson just is coming off an Achilles injury. I'm optimistic about that as well, but the injury risk is what it is. Beyond those guys, Carlos Hyde is gone. Urban Meyer's gone, and there's no reason for them to bring Carlos Hyde back because he sucks. The other guys on the team are like Nathan Cottrell and Mackay Sargent, who are both just dudes. And so behind ETN, it's Achilles injury James Robinson, and it's Raquel Armstead. If ETN has trouble, if he, like, is re-injured and James Robinson isn't ready, or if James Robinson isn't back, you know, fully healthy, it could be the Raquel Armstead show as an undisputed RB1 for Jacksonville. They're not a great team, but we want volume. And Raquel Armstead has a history of efficiency, a history of production that suggests that he could be good with volume. He's currently undrafted at DLF, unranked at Keep Trade Cut. Get him on your team, throw him on the end of your roster. He's completely free. The last guy I want to talk about, the least likely to hit, but the most fun, is Godwin Igwe Buike, who also went undrafted in 2018 after playing safety at Northwestern. I'm not completely sure why he went undrafted. I'll get to it in a second, but he's a good athlete. And it seems to me like he was pretty productive as a defensive player. He had like interceptions, what looked to me like decent tackle totals. I don't evaluate defensive players, but it's not like he was a scrub. So I'm not really sure what the situation was there. Maybe his tape was bad, but in the NFL, he's bounced around on some different practice squads, Tampa Bay, San Francisco, Philly, the Jets. He ended up playing for the Seattle Dragons of the XFL for a little bit and then was signed by the Lions in January of 2021. And with the Lions, he was converted to running back two weeks before training camp started and then ended up making the active roster as a running back just, you know, a short time later. So this is a dude who played safety for four years in college, played safety and special teams in the NFL for, what is that, two or three years, kind of as like a practice squad guy. And then within what, less than a couple months playing running back, he was good enough to make an active roster in the NFL? That's fairly impressive. And the case for him, basically, is he's a freak athlete. He's 5'11", 213, that's decent size. Um, he ran a 4.44 in the 40-yard dash, that's 90th percentile, um, 80th percentile burst score, 99th percentile agility score. And his closest physical comps, if you look at, like, height, weight, speed, burst, agility... Um, I'll just name his top eight. Darius Anderson, who is just kind of a nobody at a TCU a couple years ago. But other than that, Miles Sanders, Rashad White, who's an impressive, really good athlete in this rookie class, Cadillac Williams, the first round pick back in 2005, Melvin Gordon, Marlon Mack, Antonio Pittman, and Travis Etienne. That's like three, four, like Pro Bowl level dudes, at least three successful NFL, four successful NFL running backs on that list, plus Rashad White, plus Travis Etienne, guys who we think are going to be good for a guy who has never played running back in his life, but has good size and good athleticism. Those are solid comps. He's signed through 2022 for the Lions, and a trump card in his favor is that he carries value both on special teams and on defense. A lot of these running backs who are like end of the roster guys might be able to be good runners, good pass catchers, contribute well on offense, but most running backs in the league can do that. And if it comes down to like, we're making final cuts, Godwin Igwe Buike has this extra value that he contributes where if they get thin in the secondary, he's played defense before at a high level in college. He could step into the defensive backfield and contribute. He could contribute on special teams. He carries a lot of this just like ancillary value beyond his ability to play running back that I think makes him valuable to a team as far as like a guy at the end of the roster who can contribute in multiple ways. So that's a point in his favor. And the last thing is that the Lions depth chart is fairly weak. DeAndre Swift is a good player. 
Beyond that, it's like Craig Reynolds, who's basically a nobody. Jamar Jefferson is a little bit interesting. Jamal Williams is honestly is just hasn't been very effective as a runner um, from like an efficiency standpoint. And so Igwe Buike is not going to usurp DeAndre Swift as the RB1. That's not what we're hoping for here. But he was incredibly efficient in limited work in 2021. He had 18 carries for 118 yards and 6.56 yards per carry. He had a 122% box adjusted efficiency rating that's in the 79th percentile. And his relative success rate was absolutely incredible, 15.2% in the 97th percentile. He did have like a 42-yard run against the Steelers that was kind of like a beast mode run. He like broke a bunch of tackles, ran away from the defense. But even removing that run, like relative success rate, he's succeeding on almost all of his carries. And among 46 running backs in the league last year with between 10 and 50 carries. So guys with double digit carries and not, you know, like high volume runners that using that same like box adjusted efficiency rating, relative success rate, like percentile rank composite. He had the third highest rated score among those 46 running backs behind only Raquel Armstead, who I just talked about, and Jonathan Williams for the Saints. So among guys who were like low volume runners, he was one of the best few in the entire league and the Lions depth chart is weak and he carries extra value on special teams and defense. He's under contract through the season. He's completely free. I would say crazier things have happened than an undrafted positional convert becoming a fantasy relevant running back in the NFL, but I don't think anything crazier has ever happened, but he's got good size. He's a freak athlete and he's been efficient at the highest level of competition. The only time he's ever played the position in his life, I guess maybe he was a running back in high school. I don't fucking know, but he didn't do it in high school. He didn't do it in college. So the only thing we've seen from him is being a good running back on limited work. And he's a fun athlete. He's got good size. Let's go for it. Throw him on the end of your bench. Who knows what happens? So those are the guys, Dearness Johnson, Dontrell Hilliard, Raquel Armstead, Godwin Igwe Buike. If you're in a 16 team league, you know, you got taxi squad spots, you got the end of the roster, you're carrying, I don't know, fucking Tim Tebow's on your team, Andrew Lux on the end of your bench. Cut their asses, sign Godwin Igwe Buike, and profit. If he hits, I get the credit. You heard it here first. It's not going to happen, but let's ride. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Catch me on Sunday. I don't know what I'm doing in that video yet, but peace.